I love anthology movies. There's something very special in my eyes about the concept of a show that packages a dozen or so radically different plots into one feature-length production. The good news about anthologies is that it not only offers different artists the ability to show off radically unique styles in one film or show, but it also means that if you aren't particularly fond of one episode, you know it won't be too long until the next one comes around to offer you something new. I love the mystery attached to anthologies, as it feels like opening a new present with each title screen as you try and guess what the next episode will be all about. And so, I should be the primary audience for Netflix's ambitious anthology series, Love, Death, and Robots. But for all its positives, I'm sorry to say the show doesn't deliver in the way that I had hoped. Now, before we delve in, I have to give you all fair warning that this show is not intended for younger audiences. There's a lot of not-safe-for-work elements of this show, and it contains nudity and some extremely intense graphic violence. So if you aren't comfortable with that, I don't recommend this show to you. Now, obviously I won't be showing any gruesome or not-safe-for-work scenes in this review, but I figured I'd let you know just so you know ahead of time. Love, Death, and Robots started off as an attempt by David Fincher and Tim Miller to remake the 1981 film Heavy Metal, which I'll probably be talking about at some point in the future, but the project had a lot of trouble getting off the ground. They needed $50 million to complete the project, but there weren't any backers willing to cough up the cash. The intention was for the movie to feature several segments all created by different directors, but all animated by Blur Studios, who we'll get more into as we actually examine the final product itself. Now, some of the directors who were set to direct the various segments included Guillermo del Toro, Jeff Fowler, Zack Snyder, and Gore Verbinski. So that would have been amazing. Unfortunately, none of these people ended up ever directing any of the shorts for Love, Death, and Robots, so that's sad. Although both Paramount and Columbia Pictures at one point took interest in the project, both ultimately dropped it. All hope seemed to be lost in 2011, as it was revealed that Robert Rodriguez had purchased the rights to Heavy Metal. Now, you'll probably know how that turned out by now, but that's a story for another time. But after dropping the heavy metal backdrop, Netflix took interest in the project and was willing to fund it. And so, a two-decade-long journey finally culminated in the series coming to life. The show was built around the rather odd premise that each segment would either be about love, death, or robots. Most of them would take place in a sci-fi setting and would adopt a pretty dark and gritty tone, but this was still a far cry from the usual anthology films that tended to only be about pure horror. In this video, I'll be covering just the first season, but I will be making subsequent videos about the other two in short order, and I'll save my final thoughts until we're completely done with the whole series, in fairness. Now, there's no particular order to these episodes, because Netflix just jumbles the order all the time, so with that said, how is it? Well, let's take a look. The first stop on our journey is The Three Robots, directed by Victor Maldonado and Alfred Torres. It's based on a story by John Schultze, Schultze? I don't know how to pronounce this name, and an adapted script by Philip Gillat. He wrote so many of these episodes that uh, going forward it'll be easier for me just to name the ones that he didn't write. Fun fact about the story, by the way, the original book by Schultze is called The Three Robots Experience Objects Left Behind from the Era of Humans for the First Time. So I see why they changed it. We start off in a post-apocalyptic city that has presumably been devastated by nuclear warfare. It appears that all the humans are dead and all that's left are robots. The robots are as follows. The fun one, the grumpy one, and the boring one. They go on a self-guided tour of the city and stumble across various staples of human life along the way. I don't hate this one, and in some ways it's grown on me, but I gotta say, fun one is the only enjoyable part of this episode to me. And, uh, what did humans do with these things? Oh, man, what, what didn't they do? They, they bounce them? That's it? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Grumpy One is too undefined, in my opinion, and doesn't seem to have any real personality traits, and Grumpy was the best I could come up with. Uh, boring One is boring. She doesn't do anything more than just contrast an emotionless tone with crude humor, and, well, it's not very funny. Fun One, though, he's a blast. 
I love his character design, and he's the only one of the three robots that I actually find funny. Fun fact about Boring One, by the way, just like Otto, she's actually voiced by a real robot, which is cool. I always appreciate that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not going to nitpick this episode to death, because you all know by now my feelings on AI, but I will say that a lot of the humor here doesn't make any sense. Like, at one point, the robots are in a diner, and Grumpy and Fun don't seem to understand the concept of why humans need to eat. Like, it's an elusive idea to them that humans have to eat to survive. And even though Fun One seems to know that humans do this, he doesn't seem to know why? I'm assuming these robots were alive before humans died off, right? So why would they not understand why humans require food? Pretty much beyond common knowledge. I mean, Fun One even states that he was a baby monitor, and so it's bizarre that he wouldn't understand this concept. But even still, I feel like in spite of the animation provided by Blow Studios being exceptional here, this episode is still kind of boring. Not a lot happens in it. Another weird thing that makes very little sense in the context of a robot is at one point, Fun One tells Grumpy that his ancestor, who was a game system, was used by robots to teabag people in video games. And Grumpy One looks up what that means and is embarrassed about it. The idea that a robot would be uncomfortable about these kind of topics is very funny to me, considering they would have no reason whatsoever to think of that as a blush-worthy exchange. Now, I will give some props here, because there are a few things that I like about this episode. Fun One's design is just great. This is among my favorite robot designs that I've ever seen, and it's very reminiscent of real-life home assistant robots in Japan. I love how expressive they've made him for how minimal the details in his face screen are. I love the consistency of the fact that he's the only one who never curses because he's supposed to be the only one who isn't cynical. And that's refreshing because I know another character who didn't follow through with that very well. I also like little details like how he sits on a skull as a booster seat. That's just funny to me. Oh, and Grumpy is voiced by Gary Anthony Williams, which is a delight. It's a shame that they don't take advantage of what an absolutely brilliant performer he is. I have no doubt that Gary could have just improvised way funnier dialogue than what he was given. They play with a basketball and a cat. They go to a diner. And finally, they visit a nuclear missile silo. But you see, even though I said earlier that not a lot happens in this episode, that is true. Up until the very end, because at the 11th hour, and seemingly out of nowhere, it is revealed to us that it wasn't a nuclear fallout that killed humanity, but rather it was cats. Yes. The cat that they pet earlier in the episode is revealed to be a mastermind who can speak, and I guess he's the one who killed everybody. I didn't say that. You guys better keep petting me, just to be sure. Does this make perfect sense to you too? Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. I don't even know what else I can say about this, um, except for one thing. That cat, uh, that's Jerry from Rick and Morty. So there you go. Um, Mercifully, it's only 12 minutes long, with the credits and title sequence making it closer to 10 minutes. But if you like these guys, don't worry. They'll be returning in a later season. Okay, so I hate to spoil the party this early on in the video, but this is easily the best episode in this entire season. It's only overshadowed by one episode later on. I won't spoil which season, but uh, there is one episode that I like better than this. It's created by the studio that, in my opinion, makes the best episodes the show has to offer, Blur Studios. Blur Studios was originally supposed to make all of the shorts, like I said, and so it makes me long for what we could have gotten if that were the case. Beyond the Aquila Rift had four directors, which seemed like it would be a recipe for disaster, but amazingly it turned out to be one of the best and most engaging shorts to come out of all three seasons of this entire show. It was based on a story by Alistair Reynolds, and unlike most of the other shorts, features no celebrity performances. The episode begins with Tom, uh, captain of the Blue Goose space shuttle, as he prepares to jump into some kind of hyperspace. When he awakens from his capsule, however, he finds that They've docked in a repair station, and his crew have miraculously survived. He meets with Greta, an old friend, who explains that a charting error has resulted in the ship emerging light years away from where it was intended to. Susie, Tom's navigator, protests that such an error is impossible, but falls unconscious soon after. 
Now, see, already we have some great drama and mystery. Is Greta's explanation accurate? And if so, what happened? Is Susie right, and there isn't any way that the error could have occurred as explained? And if so, what's really going on? This is a great way to ensure immediate engagement from the audience, and I think they pulled off cementing your attention masterfully. We then get a scene where Tom and Greta reminisce about their past, and the next three minutes are completely unshowable, because they are naked. Greta explains to Tom that the station they're in is over 150,000 light years away from Earth in a different galaxy, and that hundreds of years have passed back home. Tom realizes that everyone he's ever known is dead and has a mental breakdown. Susie is awakened from her tank and insists that Greta isn't who she says she is. She attacks Greta and cuts her, but later when Tom is in bed with Greta, he notices that the cut is vanished. He demands that she tell him the truth, and Greta explains that this world isn't real. She tells him that a routing error did cause a ship to crash in another galaxy, but that she's feeding him a simulated reality because she fears he cannot accept the truth of the real one. He demands that she show him, and so she wakes him up. Tom finds out that he's crash-landed in the web of some otherworldly creature, and that his friends are almost all dead. He finds out that he's actually horribly starved and has aged decades. It's revealed that, in reality, Greta is some horrifying alien monster. Uh, horrified by this revelation, Tom is put back to sleep, and the beginning of the episode plays over again. Now this is how you do an anthology episode. This has every single beat needed to make up an anthology perfect. It has suspense, mystery, horror, and most importantly, an 11th hour twist. I love this episode so much, and I absolutely cannot recommend it enough. And as I said, Blur Studios makes the best episode in this series, and although there are some episodes sprinkled here and there that I think do a great job, I don't think any other episode in this show reaches this level. There's just so much to love about this. The subtlety and level of detail is off the charts. I mean, just for a moment, can we appreciate this reveal sequence? That's one of the greatest and smoothest transitions I've ever seen in animation. And I love the eerie hints toward the truth sprinkled here and there, like how you can see Greta's true form in the bottle's reflection, and later her shadow is actually that of the monster. This is so well done, and from my recollection anyway, no other episode does this kind of prep work to make it even more enjoyable on a second watch than a first. All said and done, there's not much that I can nitpick about this episode, and it's unfortunate to get one of the best out of the way so early, because it means I have a lot of crap to trudge through with no reprieve. Okay, so fresh off the best episode in this season, it's now time for what is probably the worst. Ice Age was directed by Tim Miller, one of the creators of the show, and is based on a story by Michael Swanwick. Okay, so Eddie Brock and Ramona Flowers buy an apartment and notice that there's an old ice box in the kitchen. They get some ice cubes out of it and notice that there's a miniature dead mammoth inside of it. From there, they find a tiny city in the ice box and it progresses very quickly until the people evolve into beings of pure light energy and then they return to cavemen. I hate this episode. It's boring, it's stupid, and the acting is so bad. There's a lost civilization in our refrigerator. Like, these two are such talented actors, and both of them have been in top-tier films. I mean, Mary Elizabeth Winstead is in one of the best comedies of all time. But they're so awkward, it's painful in this episode. There's not even any fun trivia about this. It's just dumb and boring. There's really nothing else for me to say about this that I haven't already said, so don't waste your time. Well, after that nonsense, we're back to Blur Studios, which is a great relief. We've got Sunny's Edge this time, directed by Dave Wilson and based on a story by Peter F. Hamilton. The story takes place in a dystopian world where criminals use telekinetically controlled monsters to fight to the death. Sunny, the only female competitor, refuses a request to fold the match by Dicko, that's his real name, and claims that she was abused by gangsters who cut her face. Her friend claims that her determination to never be beaten by a man again is her edge that allows her to win. Sunny fights Turbo Raptor and manages to eke out a victory in spite of nearly having her fighter killed. Later that night, Sunny is approached by Dicko's girlfriend, 
who stabs her with wolverine claws and then crushes her head. Her supposed corpse then reveals that her brain is actually inside the fighter, and her real edge was the fact that every time she steps into the ring, she's actually fighting to stay alive. She then uses her fighter to kill Dicko and his girlfriend. Okay, so this episode's pretty good. I like the twist, I like the animation, of course, and I like the quick pacing. But I have to say, I'm not as big a fan of this one as Aquila Rift. The premise of that one is a lot more straightforward, and it can be more easily explained, and the twist is a lot more shocking. I also feel like this one shoehorns a lot of nudity that isn't necessary, but that's a problem with a lot of these episodes, as I'm sure I'll be mentioning more as we go along. This one is worth a watch for sure, but I don't think it lives up to its predecessor on this list. And naming the villain Dicko, I just don't understand that at all. Um, the action sequence is extremely entertaining, though, and I love some of the hints toward the big reveal, such as the fact that Sunny doesn't move once she's piloting the fighter since her consciousness isn't in that body anymore. Now, fair warning, we're about to enter into a pretty long line of crap without much reprieve, so just be prepared for that. From here on out, there's only a few good episodes left and a lot of bad to trudge through. Next on the list, we have When the Yogurt Took Over. This one's directed by the same duo from The Three Robots. It's animated by the same studio that animated The Three Robots. Just like The Three Robots, this one is based on a story by John Schultze, and just like The Three Robots, it's not very good. When the Yogurt Took Over is the shortest episode, not just in this season, but in the entire series, clocking in at just six minutes, so at least there's that. Basically, a scientist creates sentient yogurt, how quirky, and then the yogurt gives the President of the United States a plan for the economy, but they don't follow it, and then the economy collapses. So, they give the yogurt control of the world, and then it abruptly and with no explanation flies away on yogurt cup-shaped spaceships. And that's the end. That's it. That's, not, that's all that happens. I, there's no twist here. There isn't even a conclusion to the story. We basically get the first act of a story, and then it's over. It's not funny. There's no jokes here. I have no idea what the thought process was. It's not even bad. It's just nothing. I also have no idea what this has to do with love. There's none of that. There's not a robot to be seen, and nobody dies. So I have no idea how this fits into the motif of the rest of the series. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say about this one. Uh, not very good. Next up, we have The Secret War. This episode was directed by Istvan Zorkowski, nailed it, and was based on a story by Dave Amandala. The first time I saw this series, nearly four years ago, this was actually the last episode that I watched, and funny enough, it put me to sleep. Despite looking like a Blur Studios episode, this one was made by Digic Studios from Hungary. The episode follows a platoon of soldiers from the Soviet Union who are tracking monsters in the woods. Halfway through, a whole lot of nothing happening. It's revealed to us by the commander that the Soviets used blood magic to summon demons from hell, and amazingly it backfired. So now the demons are roaming free, and they have to go and kill them before they spread. Well, the only other thing that happens in this episode is that the entire platoon dies, and then the Soviets bomb the site and kill all the demons. I know that this is the second one in a row that I have very little to say about, but to be honest, there isn't really much to say. The animation's great, but the designs of the monsters are kind of lame and remind me of the aliens from After Earth, and A Quiet Place, and The Tomorrow War, and Cloverfield. I don't like this one. It's not even short like the other bad ones. This one's 16 minutes long. Okay, so you probably noticed by now that we're seven episodes in, and so far, we've had one episode about love, and one episode about robots. They didn't diversify very well. It also means that we're not even halfway through yet. Eleven more to go, and that doesn't include this one. Anyways, Sucker of Souls was directed by Owen Sullivan and created by Studio LaFrench, and based on a story by Kirsten Cross. This one clocks in at 13 minutes, so let's see if that unlucky number makes for an unhappy viewing experience. 
Okay, so we begin with a flash forward of our main characters running away from an unknown threat, just like in the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. And then just as the screen goes black, we cut to a flashback where a group of mercenaries is helping a doctor dig up an old tomb. Immediately after unearthing it, it's revealed that the tomb belongs to Dracula, and he kills one of the mercenaries and then chases the others down a hall. He stops, however, when a cat appears in the tomb and scares him away. Supposedly, this version of Dracula hates cats. I've never heard of that, but okay. So, they return to where the other mercenaries are, and they act all jokey and nonchalant about the situation, despite the fact that their leader and the scientist are covered in blood, and insist that their friend was just murdered. They even find time for a couple of crude jokes at their expense. I don't know, this just serves to make these guys seem like they're completely out of their minds. But anyway, they end up killing Dracula by blowing him up with C4, but then after going through a secret tunnel, they end up in a prison with dozens of other vampires and presumably die. Okay, so this one isn't terrible, but it's also not great. I really don't like how strangely crude this episode is for seemingly no reason, and for as long as it is, it seems strange that they only move two rooms in the whole thing. There's another episode from this same studio and team in Season 3, so we'll be revisiting them again soon enough. But for now, all I gotta say is the animation's really good, and at least this one had a twist, which is always nice. Um, And it's something that very few of these episodes recognize is a necessity in an anthology series. Um, I guess that's it for this one. It's okay. It's definitely not among the best. Okay, so here we have it, and thankfully these are spread out enough that I won't have to revisit the second episode from these guys until season three, The Witness, directed by Alberto Miguelo and based on a script by Alberto Miguelo, which is in turn adapted from a story by Alberto Miguelo. I'm not going to be objective here, I hate this episode. I really do. It's still not as bad as the other one they did. Oh no, that one takes the cake for probably the worst episode in the entire series. But we'll get there. The Witness was one of two episodes created by Pinkman Studios. Okay, let's just get this over with. So a woman sees a man murder someone with her face, and instead of calling the police or anything, she just decides to run out into the street. And then she calls the police, and the woman on the emergency line is completely unreasonable for no reason whatsoever. Although, from my experience, that's not too inaccurate. She then goes into work at a strip club, and... Okay, so here's the thing. I can't show the next seven full minutes of footage, because it devolves into a weird, not-safe-for-work scene where a bunch of women dance around in, like, latex suits, and there's a lot of nudity, and here's the thing. I'm not a sex-negative person by any means, but I do feel like if it's gonna be in your show that it should serve a purpose... Like in cyberpunk, the nudity is meant to be a criticism of the commercialization of sex, and that's just one example of actually trying to say something, anything, anything other than just, ooh, isn't this uncomfortable? Isn't this shocking? Yes. Yes, it is. So please stop it. Oh, anyway, after that, I still can't show most of the footage from the episode because the main character runs naked through the street and finally ends up in an apartment where she kills the guy, only for it to be revealed that he's watching her from the other side of the street from a window. I really don't like this one at all. It's confusing, it has no message, and it's not very good. As a matter of fact, it's in my bottom three of this whole season. I mean, I guess it does have a twist. It's just the twist doesn't make any sense. It's still not as bad as Hibaro, but we'll get there. Next up, we've got another Blur Studios episode, although I warn you to appreciate this one while it lasts, because we only get one more from them in this season, and we've got nine more episodes to go. This one is great. Two thumbs up. So we start off with a farmer waking up and complaining about a robotic scarecrow that his neighbor Jake made for him, as his wife tells him that there's a breach in the perimeter fence. So the farmer goes and gets into a mech suit, and it's revealed to us that the breach is actually a swarm of aliens. This is apparently the norm, but the farmer soon realizes that the breach is way worse than he thought. He calls in his friends to help him secure the perimeter, but they're overwhelmed, and Jake is forced to self-destruct his robot. But then, when you think it's over, 
a giant alien comes out, and we get one last action scene to round everything out as the farmer and his wife work together to defeat the alien by shooting it through the mouth. At the 11th hour, however, as the farmers all celebrate, the camera zooms out to show us that the humans are actually the ones invading the planet and not the other way around. This is a great one. I love the setup and the payoff of the Scarecrow being deliberately described as so sturdy that the farmer can't remove it, which comes back at the end when the farmer has to use it to balance as he fights the giant alien. The overall dedication to just being pure fun is fantastic, and the twist at the end brings a straightforward story to a satisfying conclusion. Blur Studios once again delivers for us. This one is just chock full of great twists and turns to keep your attention the whole way through. The only real complaint I have about this one is that the exact same alien design is used again. I don't know. I don't know what Hollywood's obsession is with this eyeless insectoid alien that is just identical to every other alien that's come out for 10 years. I'm just really sick of it. Anyways, thank you Blur Studios for this one. It's not my favorite. Even Aquila Rift is not my absolute favorite because there's still one more down the road that's better. But Blur Studios, you delivered for us yet again. Oh, what's that? Do you hear that? It's intermission time. Okay, so I didn't know where else to put this, so I just stuck it here, because why not? But, um, well, there's a pretty annoying problem that's persistent throughout all of these episodes that I've noticed as I've been watching these again. The sound mixing is terrible. And it's not just from one episode to another, but even within episodes that I found I have to frequently turn the volume up or down in order to not have my eardrums blown out, or alternatively, to not have to turn the closed captions on just to be able to hear what's going on. It's very strange, and it hasn't been fixed since the show came out four years ago. Just thought I'd point that out. Good Hunting, also known as Princess Mononoke, <clears throat> is based on a story by Ken Liu and directed by Oliver Thomas. This one is 2D animation, which is nice, but unfortunately I won't be able to show you a good deal of the animation, because, well, the characters are naked throughout most of it, for no good reason. I'm serious, there's really no reason this woman had to take her clothes off, and it's kind of jarring. But anyway, the story begins with a hunter and his son trying to kill the spirit of this forest, who can shapeshift into a fox. The father chases the spirit to her lair, where his son finds the spirit's daughter, Yen, but he spares her while her mother is killed. The son, Liang, befriends Yen and brings her food, but she informs him that the industrial British are devastating the environment, causing her to lose her powers. Liang goes to work in Hong Kong, which is controlled by the British, to find work. While working in the city, he finds Yen being harassed by some Englishmen, and he scares them off. Yen tells him that she can no longer transform into her true form because she's now stuck as a human. Over time, Liang learns to build steampunk robots to adapt to the city's rapidly evolving machinery. One night, Yen tells Liang that the governor kidnapped her, and in an absolutely horrifying scene that I obviously can't show, has her legs hacked off and replaced with robotic ones against her will. She reveals that, over time, the governor replaced her entire body, with the exception of her head, with robotic parts, and that she murdered him in retribution. Liang promises Yen that he will help her build a new body, which he does, that resembles her old spirit form. Yen then goes out into the city and kills the attackers from earlier. Okay, so ultimately I agree with every part of the message of this one. I like the catharsis of seeing abusers get what's coming to them. I like the pro-environmental message. And ultimately, if there's any story in this bunch that I think the not-safe-for-work stuff fits with, it's probably this one. Just not all of it. What I mean by that is that Everyone else in this story only views Yen as an object of sexual pleasure, but Liang does not and truly cares for her, hence why this ultimate act of helping her to reach her true form once again renders intimacy with her impossible, proving that he never saw her that way. It's a message of true love over objectification, and I like that. I also, of course, love the animation. It's very striking and fluid, and the designs of the machines are interesting, Ultimately, I don't have many complaints about this one. It just doesn't reach the level of some of the others on this list to me. I wish there was a twist at the end. I know, you're sick of me saying that, but... Just imagine an episode of Black Mirror or The Twilight Zone without a twist, and you'll see what I mean about this type of storytelling medium. Really needing one. (laughs) 
Next up, we have The Dump. I really don't like this episode. Not to spoil my thoughts too early or anything. This one is directed by Javier Gracia and is based on a story by Joe Lansdale. Although it might look like a Blur Studios production, it is most assuredly not. This one was made by Abel and Baker. So, the dump starts off with a city inspector, played by Gary Cole, arriving at a junkyard where a man named Dave Dvorak has been living for 20 years. Dave is played by Troy Baker, by the way. The inspector tells Dave that he has to leave because someone else has bought the property and he's squatting there. Dave refuses and tells the inspector that if he listens to his tale, then Dave will leave. Tell you what, how about we crack a couple of cold beers while I... Spin your little yarn. Now, you still want auto and me gone when I'm done. Well, well, I'll sign whatever you want. And we clear on out. Dang, later. I'm a busy man, Mr. Dvorak. I don't have time for drunken ramblings and crazy stories. So Dave tells him a story about how his friend Pearlie got eaten by a garbage monster and that Dave is now friends with it. And the inspector asks Dave to sign the paper because he's busy. And then Dave excitedly calls out to Otto, who is revealed to be a real-life garbage monster. Uh, the monster eats the inspector while Dave laughs at his misery, and then Dave steals his lighter and plays fetch with his severed arm. Okay, so maybe I'm, like, overly sensitive or something, but this feels extremely gross to me. Like, what did this man do to deserve such a horrendously cruel fate? Um, he did his job of trying to keep the city clean in accordance with new sanitation laws, and because he was rude for not wanting to listen to Dave's story, he deserved to get eaten alive by a monster. Also, Dave seems like a complete psychopath in this episode, because after the inspector has said a grand total of only 40 words, he already calls out to Otto to come and kill him. Oh, but I'm afraid it does mean something to the owners of the condominiums they're building next door. So you see, everything in this dump has got to go. What did this man do that the audience is expected to hate him so much? I wouldn't even wish this fate on a murderer, let alone this guy. And not only does Dave have the inspector gruesomely eaten by a monster, he also steals from his still-moving body and then plays with his severed arm. I don't know. This just seems horrifying to me. And also, does he think that this is a victory or something? Like, as though the police aren't going to come and investigate what happened to this man? I don't like this episode. I will say, though, one thing I found funny was the ever-present Hollywood doesn't know how guns work. Yeah, I know it's from Spain, but you get the point. Like, just watch this scene and pay attention, please. I'm about to blow your head off, fat boy. Yeah, we hear a pump-action sound from this side-by-side -side shotgun. Which, if you don't know, that's the one that loads like this, not like this. So it makes very little sense that this would have happened. And they even show later that they understand how these types of shotguns work, so I have no idea what that was all about. Anyways, I hate it. That's all. Here's the last of our Blur Studios episodes for the season, but don't be too sad. They'll return next season with some fantastic episodes. But for the time being, let's just enjoy this one while it lasts. This one is directed by, oh god, Gabrielli Pinaccioli, and is based on a story by Joe Lonsdale, the same guy who wrote The Dump. In this world, werewolves are the norm and serve in the Marine Corps, but most of the soldiers seem to look down on them. While patrolling one of the werewolves, Decker is shot twice but manages to see where the attacker is and directs his men to fire on them. Later that night, the two werewolves are harassed by their sergeant. I, I love this stupid trope, by the way. Hey, you know this guy who has immense power and can rip through steel? Yeah, let's mess with him. That sounds like a great idea. Later on, the Marine's camp is attacked by a werewolf, and Decker's partner is killed. Decker tracks the werewolf and learns that it was actually a pair of them, and we get an extremely violent fight that I absolutely cannot show even a little bit of. I will say that this one is very well done, but the savagery of it is brutal in the extreme. Anyways, Decker kills the werewolf. When he returns to camp, he resigns and takes his partner's body with him. This one's good, but it's probably my least favorite of the Blur Studios episodes. I like it, but ultimately, this episode isn't as good as the others. 
There's no twist, which is disappointing, and it feels like there's not as much thought put into this one as the others. As much as I like Blur Studios episodes for being straightforward and simple, I feel like this one is a little too simple. Like there's nothing beneath the surface here. Next up we have Fish Night, directed by Davian Nanau. This one's also written by Joe Lonsdale. Okay, so this one might well take the cake for most absurd premise and conclusion of any episode in this entire show. And I say that realizing that the first episode's revelation is that cats killed off all of humanity. So two salesmen are driving around in the desert. These are door-to-door salesmen, by the way, so it does beg the question of why they're out in the middle of the desert. But whatever. Um, then their car breaks down, and they're forced to walk to the nearest station. They just say that they're going to do this, but then they don't, and they don't tell us why. Uh, inexplicably, the older guy asks his partner if he thinks that, and I quote, Just as there are human ghosts, do you think there are fish ghosts as well? As you do. Fish ghosts. And so later that night, they awaken to find that there's fish ghosts roaming around in the desert. And then the young guy gets naked and starts swimming around in the air with the fish ghosts until he gets eaten by a ghost shark. I don't understand. I mean, setting aside all the problems with fish ghosts, I have to ask, why did he get naked before he swam in the air? Why did he get eaten by a ghost shark when the ghosts are shown to be incorporeal? Um, why did the radiator go out when it was stated that it was working just fine a few minutes ago? Did the ghosts do this? And if so, why? I don't even think a prehistoric shark would want to eat human flesh, and even if it did, why would a ghost need to eat? I have so many questions. This episode is ridiculous. I don't like it. Next up on our list is Helping Hand, directed by John Yeo and based on a story by Claudine Griggs. That sounds like a Star Wars character's name. Anyway, this one is interesting. An astronaut named Alexandria is out on a mission repairing a satellite all by herself, which seems very dangerous. This odd choice is called into question by both her and the operator back on Earth, who claims that the company they work for is cutting back on costs. While she's repairing the satellite, a nail hits her oxygen tank and causes her to be flung away from the ship and the satellite. Okay, so I know I'm nitpicking to some extent, but I have to here. This seems very unlikely to happen. Astronauts have a cable attached to their suit to prevent this very thing from happening, so I don't really know why or how this happened in the first place. She didn't have any cable attached to her when she left the ship like 40 feet away. So how did she plan to get back on board, even if the nail didn't hit her tank? I don't know, it just seems kind of silly. So she calls the station, and her co-worker tells her that he's sending help, but she has 14 minutes worth of oxygen left, and the help won't get there for an hour. Alexandria decides to throw her glove in order to propel her back to the ship, but she misses the handle and floats in the opposite direction. So she rips her own arm off and throws it to propel her back to the ship. Okay, so a few things. One, why resort to such a drastic measure so quickly? If you need to throw something to propel you back to the ship, why not just take the computing system off your glove and throw that? You obviously don't need it if you are willing to throw it away. And why not try and toss the belt or the harness? It just seems like there were other options here than ripping your own arm off. Also, I'm not entirely sure that you would have the strength or ability to do that. I mean, bones are pretty tough. And there's a lot of muscle and connective tissue you'd have to rip through to do that. And I know that freezing things can sometimes make them shatter easier. But for an example, grab a frozen ham and try to break it in half with one hand. It's not very easy. Plus, you have the unimaginable amount of shock it would cause to your system of literally breaking your arm and ripping it off. So at the end, the station calls her again and asks if she still needs a hand to give us a comedic finish. So that was weird. Um, also, another thing to point out here, how does this fit with the theme of the show? There's no love, there's not a robot to be seen, and nobody dies. I don't get it. Let's move on.
So the duo that made the three robots and the yogurt have another awful addition for us. Sorry, I'm not open-minded to these at this point, but all of them have been so bad. Alternate history is basically a bunch of speculations about what if Hitler died in various ways all within seconds of each other. So he gets beaten up, he gets hit by a cart, and then the Power Rangers show up, and the rats take over, and the squids land on the moon, and then he time travels and saves himself from dying. F*** this. F*** this episode. I tap out. I tap out from alternate histories. I'm using my one get-out-of-anthology-free card. I hate this episode. This is an insult to my intelligence. This is a waste of time. I did it with the stupid yogurt, but I'm not doing it with this. Here we have The Lucky Thirteen, directed by Jeremy Chen and based on a story by Marco Kluse. This one is pretty straightforward. Lieutenant Colby is given command of a derelict ship called the Lucky 13 that has supposedly killed all of its previous commanders. Not literally, but apparently everyone on board has died in every previous mission. While serving on board, Colby manages to survive an assault from enemy ships and goes on to fly 19 more missions with it unscathed. No matter what happens, it always seems as though the ship saves the crew. Eventually, Colby's ship is shot down and she's forced to cause the ship to self-destruct but the ship waits until all the enemy soldiers are surrounding it before detonating. I like this one well enough. It's got a real urban legend kind of feel to it, like the type of stories Air Force recruits would toss around to rookies. I like that the episode doesn't quite say whether the ship was ever actually alive or not, or whether there was any supernatural stuff going on. It's fun and all, there's just not a lot to say about it. Okay, now we're back on track, because this one is great. I love this episode so much. Blind Spot was directed by Vitaly Shushko, and is based on a story by him. This episode is fantastic. Easily one of the best of the entire show. Like, the whole entire thing as a whole. Just watch the opening with me. to objective. Stay sharp, metalheads. Copy that. Countdown to mayhem. Yeah, that's great. This is amazing. Right out of the gate, my attention is grabbed. I love this man. I love his style of animation. It's just brimming with expressive colors. All of the characters have this incredible amount of personality sewn into their designs. You know, everything about them just from looking at them for a second, and that's a good thing. Apparently, he was posed to release a different animation for Netflix called Auto Battle Chess, and Netflix, get on it, man. Give this man more things to do, please. A at least let him write one more episode. So anyway, the episode opens with a gang of thieves trying to rob a semi-truck that contains a microchip. While doing so, guns and lasers and super soldiers and a giant robot stand in their way, and they fight them. And they get them. But the whole crew dies, except for the rookie. And he gets the chip... And all is okay, because the crew are actually still alive, and their robot partner, Bob, saved their brains. Meaning we can have another episode. So get to it, Netflix. I just love this so much. It's so much fun. The character designs are all great. It has a wonderful 1990s video game feel. Mixed with the same era of cartoons, like a Thundercats era kind of thing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Two thumbs way up. I'd watch a whole show about these guys, no doubt. Seeing as the only other original work here is The Witness, this one blows that episode out of the water by a magnitude of big. Mr. Shushko, I will be following your work with great zeal. Congratulations, you did it. Finally, we have Zima Blue, directed by Kevin Michael Richardson and Emma Thornett. This one is, well, it's a little bit confusing. The animation is very stylized and unique, so that's a plus. But the story and theming is a bit jumbled. So we start off with a reporter who has been invited to interview Zima Blue, a world-famous artist who has created an enormous series of murals literally the size of planets, but only paints with one color, Zima Blue. He supposedly sought out meaning in the cosmos, and so he had his body grafted with machine parts to allow him to travel all across the universe. 
When the interviewer, Claire, finally reaches him, however, he reveals that he is actually a pool-cleaning robot who was modified to look like a human. In the end, he jumps into a pool and transforms into the old robot again. Okay, so I get the message, more or less. The idea is that no matter how much reach you have, simplicity is sometimes preferable to fame. But the message, I do feel, is clouded somewhat by the fact that they told us earlier he was a human, and we even see that he has human parts. It's just this one part that is super confusing to me. Did these guys not realize that there was a miniature robot inside this man? Oh, whatever. It's still a fun episode, and it's decent enough, if a little confusing. I appreciate the sort of scope and scale and how dramatic all of these different shots are. But uh, ultimately, it's just okay. All right, we're at the end. <laughs> ah, just kidding. We're only halfway done. Like, literally, we still have 17 more episodes to go. But not in this video. I hate to have to save my final thoughts and all for a future video, but I want to keep you all in suspense until the grand finale of Season 3. Worry not, it won't be much longer until the second part is out, but for now, you'll just have to wait and see what the rest of this series has in store. Not to spoil anything, but the best and worst of the show are still ahead. Thank you for watching. This was a long one, huh? Yeah, I really didn't think this would take that long, and uh, I certainly didn't realize when I started that I wouldn't be able to show much footage because how not safe for work the show is. But anyway, like the video if you liked it, dislike the video if you didn't like it, and subscribe for more. That's all for now.